In fire, you can plan everything out to the minute, and a minute before that, everything changes. Dan Felix. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Georgia Lobin, or Georgia the firefighting legend, whichever you prefer, and I did my project on firefighting and emergency medical response. Fair warning, my speech is going to get pretty heated. Firefighting is the action or process of extinguishing fires or protecting others from hazardous and harmful dangers as a part of their jobs. And an emergency medical responder is somebody who is specially trained to provide out of hospital care in emergency situations. The purpose of these two jobs is to prevent fires and dangers, to protect citizens and to preserve life. Whilst one performs such acts, it is of great importance to have good values, to always respect those around you, to have integrity, to give unconditional service, and to have courage as often as one can in the work environment in order to complete the job safely. With a job such as these, there is a lot of trauma that comes with it. Firefighters and EMRs experience death and loss daily, having to walk away from a bad situation and likely having to do it again the following day. One thing that has really impacted me during what I have experienced was something one of the firefighters had said to me during an interview. I asked him how he was able to cope with such trauma and how he was able to detach himself from the situation. He replied to me, this job has always been a calling for me and it became my passion to help my fellow community. Some days the case is mild, such as the death of an elderly man or woman who had passed peacefully. Other days, you may be met with the death of a child. In such an event, the thoughts going through one's head are to think of every possible solution to get the pulse back and of the child breathing again, just a sign of hope. Many people who I've met on my journey have also expressed how rewarding it feels to accomplish protecting their community and the amazing things that they experience. One man described how he felt privileged to have delivered three babies in his lifetime and to have been able to see the first glance of a mother looking upon her newborn. The official origination of firefighting is said to be from the third century BC in Rome. A man named Marcus Licinius Crassus created a group of 500 men who would patrol the city as an emergency force and security response. However, when there was a cry for help during a fire, the firemen would not help immediately, but would rather negotiate a price with the owner of the house in exchange for putting out the fire. Most of the time, the negotiating would take too long, or the suggested price was not up to standard for the firefighters, and they would just leave the building to burn. The official fire brigade was called the Vigiles, and was founded in 60 AD by Emperor Nero of Rome. Their system was less corrupt than the previous hundreds of years, as they would immediately create a line from the nearest water source, leading to where the fire was. The firefighters would then fill up buckets of water at one end and pass them to one another towards the other end of the line. Imagine, your house is burning down and there are a bunch of men running around hysterically in dresses and sandals shouting at each other. <laughs> this method was unfortunately not always effective as most of the structures were made out of wood and would need to be rebuilt in the end. The main purpose of the fire brigade was to prevent the spread of fires and to ensure the safety of the citizens. Firefighting evolved to become 6,000 men with axes and buckets, who also had the authority to distribute corporal punishment to lawbreakers. In modern times, when there is an emergency, a call will be placed by whomever needs assistance. This call will go to a helpline for all emergencies, and once the address and situation has been confirmed, the call centre will then call the, co the reception at the fire station. The firefighter on duty rings an alert bell and firefighters will have one to three minutes to have full gear on and to be stationed by the vehicle. The platoon commander or lieutenant will then address the firefighters responding and will briefly explain the emergency. Ambulances will often be sent with as well as advanced life support responders. Once on scene, different groups of personnel will perform certain tasks based on their specializations and skill set. After an evaluation has happened about what had occurred, the emergency responders return to the station. Currently, too many firefighting services around the world, especially those from poor resource municipalities, are struggling to provide sustainable and cost-effective emergency services. 
The number of lives lost by an injury sustained as a result of fires is alarming. Statistics show that South Africa, in its analysis of causes of death based on death certificates, proves that there are 2,241 deaths due to smoke, fire and flames in 2015 alone, this in <laughs> which, which indicates that the more work is required by all stakeholders led by government to deal with fires to reduce the number of deaths and injuries. South Africa has one of the highest levels of death and disability from injury in the world, of which 48% involves the need of the fire department. I completed my hours during my practical by going Sundays to the fire station, where I soon learned that the firefighting breakfast of champions was from the Pizza Perfect down the road. <laughs> I was also fortunate to complete a health and safety course for basic firefighting and my first aid. Some things that I learned were CPR and that a first aider is not obligated morally nor legally to assist in an emergency. As a warning to everybody, <laughs> Be kind to those around you, because you never know who may be the nearest first aider. Once they have begun treating a patient, they should never hand their patient over to somebody with less or of the same qualification as a first aider. They should only stop treating someone when they are exhausted or when someone of a higher ranking has arrived. The most important thing to remember is that your safety comes first, because you cannot assist in an emergency if you yourself are injured. One day, I was even able to assist on a patient during school hours. We were in woodwork class, and I noticed that my fellow classmate, Hannah Jorgensen, had torn her tights slightly in the front of her leg. She exclaimed to me that the gouge had just slipped and that it was nothing serious. Well, after some further inspection, it proved to be a bit more concerning than she had exclaimed, and Hannah now had quite a deep open wound. After a lot of convincing, we both made our way to the office for a patch up and I had to actually hold the wound closed whilst a butterfly plaster was placed over it. All the while, Hannah continued to say how it wasn't even sore and that she was perfectly fine. Two hours later and a trip to the hospital, I think she was convinced otherwise. This has truly been an incredible journey and it is safe to say that I have learned and seen a lot in the past couple of months, which has proven to be useful to me as I have gained a lot of confidence in the path to my future. I intend to now pursue a career in medicine and will be continuing with my second level of first aid. Medicine has also become a passion of mine to learn about. I have gained a lot of appreciation for our health and safety responders, during my project as I have seen their hard work and determination firsthand. The same determination I will be working towards to achieve my goal one day and complete my degree, and I hope to continue volunteering at the fire station. I would like to thank Station 16 for allowing me to complete my hours and for always making me feel welcomed and useful whilst spending my time there. I would like to thank my sisters for their support and helping me choose my project topic. To my stepfather, Brad, for giving me unconditional support and for helping me with my written components. To the school for giving me this incredible opportunity. My mom for paying for the fees of all my courses and for her support. To the handwork and woodwork teachers for helping me complete my book and stand throughout the pandemic. <laughs> Ms. Miller for giving me assistance on my written components. To my internal mentor, Mrs. Wane, for always being so patient with me and always offering advice when I needed it. And lastly, to the audience for taking the time to listen to my speech. I leave you with this quote. Security is mostly a superstition. It does not exist in nature, nor do the children of man as a whole experience it. Avoiding danger is no safer in the long run than outright exposure. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing. Helen Keller. Thank you.